Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this week's Cutting Edge Lecture Series. Uh, we're very, very pleased to be joined uh, by Dr. Rochelle Burgess, who is an Associate Professor in Global Health at the University College London, and she's the Deputy Director of the UCL Centre for, no for Global Non-Communicable Diseases. She was actually previously at the LSE. She did her PhD here, and she was also a research fellow at the Firdaus Lalji Center of Africa. So we're really welcoming her back today. Welcome back. Uh, she has a very long and impressive list of publications spanning both kind of development studies in social science, as well as medical journals such as the Global Health BM BMJ, The Lancet, and Nature. And she's recently published a book, Rethinking Global Health, Frameworks for, of Power, Critical Approaches to Health, which I think brings together a lot of her work. And it looks at global health both in terms of its practices, but also as a kind of knowledge system through which power operates through agenda setting and knowledge production. And when I was preparing this intro, I learned that this book is also open access, so students can definitely go and check it out. Much of her previous work has been in Southern Africa, in South Africa and Zimbabwe, but she's also worked on health issues in the UK, as well as within Colombia, which her presentation today focuses on. When we asked our colleagues in, in working in public health in the department for kind of dream speakers for this series, she was at the top of the list. And looking at her presentation ahead, I can see that she's kind of looking at critical health, uh, public health in a critical way, but also looking more bro broadly about power and knowledge within development studies. So it has broad relevance for all of you. Um, she's joined today on the stage by our own Philippa Madovsky, who is also an associate professor in our own department in ID. She works on public health policy within the context of development, focusing on issues such as healthcare financing, equity and access, and also migrant and refugee health, which I think she's going to bring in today especially. She's also one of my colleagues who I think asks some of the best and most thoughtful questions in seminars. So I expect her to be an excellent discussant today and help us get warmed up for our Q&A. So Rochelle is going to have 45 minutes for her presentation. And then Philippa is going to discuss for about 15 minutes and maybe have a little bit of a discussion between them before we open it out to Q&A. Um, I want to re uh, remind you guys uh, to keep your questions short because, so we have uh, time for everybody. So without further ado, let us give Rochelle a round of applause. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction. I always have these moments when, can you see me? I'm so short. I have this fear that like you can't see any of me. Is that somewhat better? Yes. Right, okay. <laughs> um, I, should, I used to like stand on stuff sometimes when I talk. But we'll see. Um, when I hear introductions of my, myself, I, I, I start to feel really tired in the sense that like, you know, all of the, there's, there's a lot of labor that goes into, into those things, and sometimes I sort of, you keep going and forget about, you know, all of that stuff. But anyway, thank you so much. It was such a, what's a warm welcome and, and really nice to, to come home, as it were. Um, I think the last time I was in the old building, I was pregnant, and my son is six years old now, so it's any indication how long it's been. Uh, so I'm... I'm here today, I'm, I'm going to speak about my, my body of work, which, which takes a, a deep interest in staying with complexity, staying with the trouble, as many say, and trying to push boundaries on, on what we consider treatment within mental health landscapes. Many of the theoretical positions that I hold were developed here at the LSE. I studied community health psychology with Professor Kathy Campbell, who's now emeritus. Um, I was taught by people like Sandra Drifchelovic, Tim Allen, Susan Rifkin, Sylvia Chant, Nyla Kabir, Sumi Madak, a lot of the people who I assume you read and who you're still taught by. Um, so hopefully nothing that I say will sound too far out of the field. 
Um, but it was in their work that I found, found respite and an opportunity to imagine and demand more of a growing field, which uh, when I started my doctorate in sort of 2008, was only just launched the Movement for Global Mental Health. And this movement has always had a deep interest in ethics and justice uh, from the perspective and orientation of service user rights and the jarring injustices that mark mental health service use globally, particularly for those who suffer from severe mental illness. And in the early years, a lot of their efforts were around championing access, closing the treatment gap, doing this through mobilization of evidence, really important evidence. Um, but along the way, I started to feel a bit of a disconnect between the voice demands of people that I spoke to. I'm a qualitative social scientist, so I spend a lot of time doing participatory research, qualitative research, um, and very much sort of hearing a difference between the demands of the people I spoke to and the directions that policy takes. And so it's there that that sort of interest in power and voice and criticality resides. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about global mental health as a field today, um, but I, I'm going to focus a bit on how my time there has led to me taking, choosing to take quite seriously how we stay with people's voices, how we follow that to change what constitutes care, uh, and, and really sort of trying to take seriously the, the statement of one, one woman who I met during my ethnography in rural KwaZulu-Natal, and during one of my life history interviews, she said to me, you cannot be free if you don't have money. Money sets you free. Am I wrong? And I will never forget it because I don't think she's wrong. And I think what follows is really about how we can stay with that. Let's see if I can advance these slides in any sort of way that alludes to competence. There you go. Okay, so where do I begin? Where do we begin? Uh, I want to talk about three things broadly today. Um, so I'm going to talk about adversity as, as a context quite briefly, and I want to follow some of the definitions that we use around adversity through to the narrative of how we think about responding to the mental health consequences of adversity. Then uh, I want to speak about this notion of repair, which I've been sort of informed by the work of anthropological studies, very range of anthropological studies and perspectives on repair and something similar called remedy, because they open up a space to sort of overcome some of the unintended consequences that can be associated with mainstream offerings of services, which at times feels as if it's turning away from the more complicated realities that people face instead of towards it. And then finally, I will spend most of my time today talking about community-led approaches, um, which are bound up in notions of community development, which I, I'm sure you know lots about. Um, what they offer in terms of how we can consider new visions and new landscapes for mental health care and services and dialogues between communities and services. And I'll talk specifically about Colombia in that work, uh, where I've been working uh, for the past, uh, gosh, uh, some years, I'm not a math person, less than 10 years, more than five, uh, working, um, working with communities around sort of advancing different spaces for mental health support. So it will be no surprise to anyone here that mental health outcomes are directly related to the context of development. And so the figure on this slide is taken from uh, a 2018 paper within the Lancet Commission on uh, social, uh, social de well, the paper is on social determinants and global mental health, but it's on um, sustainable development. This commission is on sustainable development and uh, global mental health. And this uh, work by Cricklund, Cricklund, uh, who's from Cape Town and is currently based at King's, does a lot of work at trying to unpack the relationships between poverty and other social factors and mental health outcomes. Um, and what he's done here is, is, I think, really important of work in trying to sort of highlight the 
the stages and the processes through which mental health becomes connected to these big contextual, social, political ideas. Um, so for example, if we stay, look at the one here on environmental events, you can think of things like natural disasters, um, conflict, climate change, related migration, and the proximal factors of trauma and distress that then has knock-on consequences for the development of poor mental health outcomes. Um, and within sort of the mainstream literature, this has sort of been followed on, and when I say mainstream, I typically talk about things like the World Health Organization, who sets sort of global standards for what we should be attempting to achieve in these spaces. So there's a WHO um, sort of work stream that is very interested in mental health and psychosocial supports in context of adversity. Um, adversity uh, in this space is thought of in one of two ways. So first in a single event, so thinking about things like accidents or natural disasters, or also in context of chronic adversity, so thinking about things like poverty, endemic violence, long-term conflict or displacement. And both, and recognizing that these things have acute, so immediate, but also long wave, long term consequences for mental health. But I think what's really important when sort of thinking about those definitions is that in reality, we often find that things are rarely acute or chronic. So, you know, you don't necessarily have a single event, you have single events that occur alongside chronic conditions, and I'm sure this is something that chronic social conditions, chronic social processes that are driving long-term experiences for people shaping the way people live their lives. And you can really think of that uh, quite clearly uh, in some parts of the world. So if we talk about, for example, here I have a bit of a snapshot of some factors related to poor mental health in the Western Pacific region, where about almost two billion people live. And they recently have done some amazing work in sort of revising their plan for the implementation of mental health uh, services. And within that, they try to hold attention to things that are both chronic and also seem like an instantaneous event. So they are attentive to the ways in which increasingly they are small island states that make up many of the, uh, the countries in that region are particularly exposed to extreme weather events, which will then have associated mental health impacts. Um, something like violence against women, where these conditions are more endemic and sort of connected to familial and social contexts around um, violence. Uh, in the region, they also have uh, sort of, well not sort of, they have very high rates of, of suicide, particularly among young indigenous populations, and I think in that context it points to both the immediate and the long-term processes that lead to poor mental health outcomes, what it means to be an indigenous person in, in a place, in, in land, is, uh, is quite, uh, yes, I think I will, that's, I'll stop there. Um, and then, of course, they also were very interested in the way COVID affected communities. So COVID, which emerges as this sort of immediate uh, crisis, which has very long wave consequences. And one of the ones that was particularly concerning to people was this idea of the way it contributed to food insecurity in places where this was not a problem before. And so ultimately, if we think about how different social events create certain landscapes that make poor mental health a bigger reality, then we need to think a bit differently about how we might structure, <clears throat> structure our mental health supports. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the work that I do in the UK because I think it's really illuminated for me the, the ways in which adversity is embedded within the everyday systems through which people negotiate their lives. Um, so in the last few years, I've been doing work uh, on the mental health consequences of the Windrush scandal in the UK and the wider hostile environment. Uh, this work, which is being conducted alongside survivors, we've identified that 
the core site of traumatization and re-traumatization is not just the act of exclusion itself that happened to people who were stripped of their identity and their passports and told they were no longer citizens, but actually the long wave consequences of these acts and also the dehumanizing processes that are linked to their quests for justice, namely in this context, um, the compensation scheme, which emerges for many people as a site of re-traumatization. Um, and so in our ongoing analysis of sort of stories from survivors, and we're doing this with stories in the public domain, we sort of really are identifying um, sort of patterns that illuminate that how somatic systems and psychological systems are really connected to these political structures. And so, in a way, this it makes for me something really under, not undeniable, like that, that some people live lives where adversity is unavoidable. And I think that that's something that we need to hold on to when we start to plan for services. So, this slide goes through a list of sort of the prioritized interventions that are proposed um, within sort of mainstream guidelines for how we might work through work on the work to promote the mental health of groups living through adversity. Many of these have been tested through randomized control trials with different populations and found to be effective. So that's how they continue to be used and, and applied and expanded. And so I'll talk a little bit about each of these in turn, I don't know if people are familiar with these. I'm not sure how many mental health gurus are also in the room with, with me today. For the sake of those who aren't, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about each of these. So Problem Management Plus uh, is a type of intervention that is oriented towards individuals. It's run for individuals, but it's been, it has an additional package of providing um, opportunities to guide people through a process of sort of problem identification and problem solving. So that sits alongside sort of your mental health promotion stuff. This is how you identify symptoms. This is, might be how you refer yourself to further treatment and trying to help, pe trying to acknowledge that there are social dimensions to people's lives that, that they're dealing with. The Thinking Healthy program is rooted in principles of cognitive behavioral therapy. And so for those who aren't familiar, cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT is a intervention package where the foundational principles are connected to the need to replace and shift problematic patterns in thinking that might lead people to deepen and maintain their distress and sort of replace them with new ways of looking at and, and approaching the world. And so this was initially tested uh, with populations of women with perinatal depression living in adverse settings, but has also been expanded elsewhere. Uh, and then finally, uh, group interpersonal therapy is a group-based intervention. Um, the new guidelines that came out about, around this, around 2020, go through a set of uh, go through a set of stages that sort of guide people through um, identifying not just the sort of wider social dimensions, but the interpersonal relationships in your life that are important to enabling good mental health. It also invites key people in your life into that process. And it's had a wide range of cultural adaptations because it's felt to be connected meaningfully um, to many different, for lack of a better word here, local ways of thinking about the world and thinking about what's important to your well-being. Um, so, for example, there are, I know colleagues who have been working with this in Uganda in the context of, of HIV. And so what I, I want to say is that all of these are necessary. They become necessary in the landscape of global mental health around that point of equity, of access. One of the big reasons and, and strengths around these approaches is that they are delivered by lay people. And so the idea that community members can contribute to the delivery of supports. You don't need a lot of specialists because there are very few specialists available. Um, however, I think somewhere along the way, we've confused the, the point of necessary and sufficient. So I think that while these are necessary, they are insufficient. And they become very clearly insufficient when you hold on to the reality of what adversity means. And so um, in his closing remarks, when he gave up the post in 2020, special repertoire, um, Denis Porras wrote about global mental health specifically. Uh, and his main concern 
was around this idea of a treatment gap in the sense that there is a gap of sorts, but it's not necessarily around treatment. It's in the way that we think about what the problem is to be solved. So the movement is not focused on how poverty and social injustice produce mental distress. The focus has been on burden and cost of mental health disorders, which is not consistent with a human rights-based approach that has been shown to be methodologically flawed and what they've done is shown to be methodologically flawed. And the refocus remains on individual rather than systemic change as a mean of tackling the poverty and oppression uh, of concern. And I think one of the things that has always been posed to me when I sort of bring this up is this question of, is that the job of a health practitioner? Where do they start and where do they end? Is that their responsibility? And I think one of the things I always think about is that if that is not within your responsibility, I'm sorry that that is so hard to read, but I will read to you. I'm very good at reading to people now because I read to my son all the time. Um, there is this, um, if we do not um, sort of do that, if we become practitioners who sort of stick within the systems without questioning it, then there is an inherent violence in ignoring the way that people talk about themselves and their needs and their lives. And there's a lot to learn um, in the ways that Sadia Hartman and, and other black critical scholars talk about the ways in which we need to turn towards, turn back towards stories and look at the alternative framings that could exist within stories. And so in this book, Wayward Lies and Beautiful Experiments, she sort of reimagines a history in time for black people in America from the voices of the people themselves. Because the only things we start to know or that we do know are the things that get into the canon, right? So get into our peer-reviewed journals, get into those spaces. But of course, to get into those spaces, you have to fit a certain paradigm. You have to speak a certain way. You have to be interested in a certain thing. And in terms of relationships to black life, it is about deficits. It's about suffering. It's about struggle. And never about illuminating the way people survive or thrive. So forgetting that even in the face of enormous structural violence, that people imagine a life otherwise. They build a life otherwise. They live a life otherwise. Not in the future, but right now. And that is such a powerful starting point, I think. A much more powerful and meaningful starting point for how we might want to imagine how people living through adversity might imagine their lives in the future and seeing the role of a practitioner to support that journey rather than to solely be within the realms of diagnosis and, uh, and treatment. And so this is why repair becomes so important to me as a concept. I will say that um, I've come to this framework of repair only recently. An anthropologist named Kit Davis saw a talk of mine. I'm not an anthropologist, but I tend to hang out with a lot of them. Um, but they make me very nervous. They're very serious. Right? They're more serious than you guys. And, and one of the reasons I think that they're, they're really serious is they're sort of very deep, deep into theory. And so Kid Davis said to me when I was at this talk that I didn't really understand why I was there, she said, repair would offer you a really meaningful space to think about and advance your work. And really, what it allowed me to do was a couple of things. It allowed me to sort of pick up all of these things that I felt were problematic in the space of global health and global mental health around this idea of epistemic injustice. So epistemic injustice, this fancy way of saying not hearing people, not seeing their ways of knowing as meaningful, as valid, as critical to the work that we do. And these are sort of four spaces that I have had some time to reflect on um, alongside colleagues who work in this space. Um, so this idea of what are the harms of epistemic injustice, so this idea of silencing and what it creates. Um, logics of care, which is what I'll mostly talk about today. Linguistic colonia coloniality, I won't talk about today. But the hyper-rationality and the social reproduction of colonial knowledge practices, which I will talk about today. Because ultimately, repair gives us this chance 
to, to respond to this demand that seems to be quite prevalent in global health around whose voices should be centered, around how we work to support people achieving good health and well-being in both the short and long term, um, and what it means in relation to how we practically work in the wake of, of, of many things. And so this term, the wake, I borrow from Christina Sharp, who talks about the wake and the afterlife of, of colonialism, but also very much important to the global health space, which lives in the active wake of colonialism, um, neocolonialism, all these sort of sites of, of very complex realities. Um, and it allows us to really interrogate how logics of care commit epistemic injustice and what sorts of harms might be in it, unintentionally created by maintaining the status quo. I found a faster way to change that. So what is repair? Um, so repair is this interest in wholeness um, Richmond and, and Lemons talk about it um, in relationship to uh, sort of anthropolo anthropology of sort of religions. But I found their definition to be incredibly valued because it's ultimately this way or mode of thinking that draws our attention to the way people work to restore wholeness in their lives. So what are people doing in the here and now when they can, when they are able to, to restore wholeness? and sort of going with that. And for me, it's this need to pay attention to how people try to make right ruptures in their lives, in their social world. And then this forces our logic of care beyond treatment and towards projects potentially of social change and social justice. And in that type of space, it opens up an opportunity for practitioners to do more, to, to be more. I find that this also connects to another anthropological concept of remedy, and Matthew Wolf Mayer talks about this in his work around sort of trying to differentiate between sort of the types of ways people receive care. So differentiating between uh, remedy, which looks at sort of situational, but thought of as temporary perspectives of need that are treated by remedy, and he sort of connects that to a, a um, a metaphor around uh, disability and the way like a prosthetic provides remedy but you might not use that all the time uh, and that's separated from therapy which is a temporary relief that's working towards something permanent and then this idea that a cure might exist so one day you might find a cure for something and sort of trying to differentiate between these these things as separate processes that trigger different things um, and so I sort of feel as though repair and remedy create this opening for this different logic of care. Uh, in Christina Sharp's new work, Ordinary Notes, uh, she says, I want to think of care as an antidote to violence. I want to think of care in the register of Bonnie, I've got some reversing of letters, so Bonnie, Bonnie Hoying, who outlines when she tells us that care is to cultivate anticipation of another world and to live now dedicated to the task of turning this world into a better one. And I think a logic of care in this way moves beyond bodies and towards transformation and an opportunity for those who are willing and able to accompany others on those journeys. It also speaks to this idea, as I said, of the hyper-rationality of, of, and social production of crown colonial knowledge practices. Um, so this, for me, means a, a questioning of the way that um, some of our knowledge practices contribute to the social reproduction of certain ways of knowing. So earlier this year, in a, a, one, a theory piece I, I wrote, I was talking about how when we think about the social, we sometimes put them in these different categories. So the first figure I showed you of the, um, uh, the sort of social determinants or the sustainable development goals broken up as separated things or slightly connected things. Um, and in this sort of categorization of the social, we sort of look at social determinants 
in disparate ways and not always as connected or additive. And so really what this figure here tries to do is try to orient us to two things. That when you see a social determinant, it is socially determined. Something created that social determinant. Something created bad housing, something created those inequalities, something created that crisis. And usually the things behind that are better encapsulated within like social political economies. So in our work here, we try to sort of think about what are the determinants of those determinants. What determines those social determinants to emerge in the context of global mental health? And what we try to do here is combine that with perspectives of intersectionality, to refuse to ignore that when you see a person, you're actually seeing multiplicities of communities intersecting. You're seeing incredible complexities. That's what makes being a human so hard. That's what makes the extension of compassion so hard. We want to simplify things, but in reality, this is people. This is always people. And so how do we create pathways, conceptualizations, this is how I trick myself into moving faster, uh, that allow us to hold that complexity? So this is a framework that we've sort of come up with to suggest that and sort of resist the way in which sort of traditional mainstream westernized approaches to thinking about the social don't limit our ways of thinking about solutions. So this is it, this idea, it's drawn a lot on the work of Nancy Krieger, but it's this idea that chooses us to think about analysis as the, the cause of disease in relation to political and economic structures, processes, power, and relationships, both contemporary and critically historically. We cannot leave there is no past, it is always present. I think the historians are really good at talking about that. Because they shape the conditions where people work, live, and attempt to survive. So this is what we suggest. We suggest everybody should use something like this, where you try to locate yourself or locate people within this, these, these matrices of intersecting social realities. And it puts the causes of mental health in a more direct relationship to how social, political, and economic processes shape in the past and present shape contemporary realities. And it does away with this idea that you have something that is distal and proximal. Because I imagine that anybody who tells you who is living through something does not separate something as a distal or proximal determinant. They just live it as a determinant of their life. I'm going to skip that, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Let's get to the case study, OK? Uh, because I would like to hear you guys speak as well. So one of the, look, I fell in love with development here. I didn't know anything about development before I came to the LSE. It's a very nice place to be and think. And, and you're very, very lucky to be here and to have this opportunity. It will be this most stressful year of your life. But then you'll look back at it and think, oh my god, wasn't it amazing? That time we saw that really weird lady talk about stuff. Anyway. Um, but one of the most important things I learned about uh, community and development was that it emerges as this opportunity for transformation. So community, not as a static location, but as a process through which change can occur. Um, it sort of as a space in development studies emerges as this opportunity to transition towards local ownership of development projects, to move away from sort of interventionalism and towards sort of community-led, person-centered, Amartya Sen type work. Um, and the key issues in development text, I'm sure maybe you guys are still reading that one. Um, community development is often oriented around a couple, two principles. Right? And so the first is this idea of development of and for a community, so from within or bottom up. Uh, and the second is sort of like how development occurs via community decision making processes. Um, but I think, and I, I don't really want to romanticize the idea of community. Community is incredibly complex. It is a site of constant negotiation and renegotiation because as a process it is very much connected to how we see ourselves. So we are at stake in the making and unmaking of community. But in health landscapes, a lot of times we don't 
hold that complexity of community. We think of community as like a target population or a target group. We might think of it as a marginalized population or a, a population that's linked to protected characteristics. And these columns on the other side, communities of practice and communities of shared experience, I think are where you start to see the more transformative notions of community. And so this is the premise on which we built our most recent project in Colombia. So this is a collaboration between uh, two community organizations, Kambuvipak, um, which is a collaborative of former um, guerrilla members who have reincorporated into society and are rebuilding, actively rebuilding their community post-conflict. Um, and also with Corpa Manigua, which is a local NGO that works around the rights and, and needs and well-being for women and communities in Florencia, which is a city center in Caquetá, where, uh, the department where we work. Um, and largely they're, they're working with people who were internally displaced by the conflict. Our academic partners um, are here, some are here at the LSE, Sandra Chevchelovich at the uh, Department for Psychological and Behavioral Sciences, uh, as well as partners at Universidad de Los Andes. And so a little bit of the context and who we're working with. So I've already mentioned that our key partners are community organizations, but we're working with communities who are now, the Colombia is, is, uh, is in a st status of being post-accord. So there has been a, a peace treaty signed and they're in the process of working out what it means to ratify that peace, to bring that peace to, to fruition. Um, and so they're work, we're working with communities who within that space have been recognized as victims of the conflict. And that recognition becomes really important for many reasons in terms of social, socially, in terms of gaining access to resources and supports, but also the um, former combatant, uh, uh, sorry, not former combatant, the former guerrilla members who are now sort of rebuilding their lives uh, now, that the, now that the need for their conflict uh, has come to an end. Um, so here we're there's talking about really high levels of mental health needs, and just not just in these populations, but also nationally. So you have millions of people who have been identified as, as victims, um, but also people who are maybe not direct, but indirectly affected. And so you have one in four people experiencing common mental disorder. Um, and then you're also working around these sort of structural determinants of poor mental health as well. So in that department of Kakata, you've got very high levels of poverty, high levels of unemployment, and um, sort of a, the loss of, of identity that kind of can come with uh, long-term displacement for some people. So, uh, we started with this idea of wanting to work with communities living in these spaces to determine what mental health supports should look like. We embedded this within the paradigm of participatory action research, which um, sort of links to an emancipa more emancipatory forms of participatory research. It has roots in liberation struggles of Latin America, Asia, and, and various context on the African continent. And the initial design is always to try and keep connection to, um, to these contexts. And you're trying to promote development of empowerment through thinking about these things and through enabling work in areas that make sense to people. So really thought of this idea of enlightening and awakening of common peoples. Um, and so what did this look like in practice? So in the inner circle here, is the cycles of participatory action research. And on the outside are the steps of how we organized it into sort of three broad stages. So the first stage is, is called sort of a diagnostic stage, but really it's trying to meaningfully understand, work with local communities to understand their practices around mental health, their thinking around mental health, and then also working with them to sort of make sense of how that all comes together. And the second step around the intervention is working with large numbers of community members who would be the users of this intervention at some point 
to design the intervention. And then the intervention sort of runs for a little while, and then we do an evaluation. And so we have a formal evaluation with scales and all that stuff, but we also have a participatory community-led evaluation piece which, piece, which is photo voice. So if you start, we started with local knowledge. We did 30 focus groups um, over the course of about six months. Um, worked with hundreds of people in doing so and organized those focus group discussions around activities like word association where we're getting people to think about these big category ideas, emotional distress, well-being, treatment, care, and really separating treatment and care within that space to acknowledge that they serve to potentially serve, serve different purposes. Uh, and also the tree of life, which is a methodology that allows people to connect past and present and sort of the future, to sort of have hopes for the future and embed that within our intervention design. So my Spanish is really bad. I will read the English bits. Um, but for those who can speak Spanish, the Spanish is there for you to read. Um, what we found in both spaces, um, my Spanish is getting better, by the way. That my team always tells me it's getting better. Um, but so in thinking about mental health services and people's experiences of mental health services, um, they sort of have this experience of therapy, which is a big piece of how we think about mental health as, as relatively negative. Um, sort of having, you know, this perspective of thinking that somebody might be able to help you but then they just start giving you pills and you don't really understand why, you don't feel listened to. And this sort of tension around actually two sort of separate knowledge systems that are in that room that are trying to sort of negotiate some shared end, but really feeling like that's not what's happening. And that sort of can contribute to this wider distrust in the service. But what was really important in that sort of one geographical context, because you have different notions of community, you have different experiences or different definitions of what distrust or mistrust might look like. So it's very different um, uh, in the urban site to the rural site. And some of the things in terms of the rural site connect to the way in which um, former FARC members talk about how the state uses or used ideas of mental health around sort of limiting their everyday experiences. So there's a bit of concern about what it might mean to be labeled with something and how those labels might be used against you in completely different ways. Um, so this idea of like telling lies about our past. You say one thing and then they take that information and turn it into something else. Um, and that's something different to how somebody in Florencia, which is our urban site, might be talking about access to hospitals and, and things like that. So their contact with services also looks really different. Um, so what was really interesting is also that people had very clear accounts of how they exist outside of services, particularly in our rural communities um, where there are no mental health services at all. Services move in and out, they sort of visit and leave. And so the way in which people sort of take care of themselves connects to a lot of notions of spirituality, faith, um, indigenous practices, indigenous healing, um, which becomes really, really important um, for them. Um, and it's also connected to their sort of lives as guerrillas and, and the, the former guerrillas and, and what they're trying to hold on to from their past the things that are meaningful for their identity, and so expressing and practicing those things become really important. Um, and so it sort of became really clear when we were talking to communities about care that um, their care was oriented toward this idea of repair, this idea of making whole. And the way that that manifested is actually through multiple different types of practices at different levels. So you have caring for your physical environment or your territory, sort of thinking about community as place, um, which was really important for people from uh, our rural communities. In the city centers, they thought of the state and NGO services as really bound up in being able to contribute to care, because particularly with NGOs, that's the site where a lot of needs are met. 
Uh, in terms of the relational context, uh, lots of importance of sort of restoring bonds and maintaining bonds with family and friends. And individually, about the importance of strength. Mente Ocupada is about sort of keeping the mind occupied, keeping focused. Um, and in some, in the urban spaces, they also talked a lot about how music was very therapeutic and having experiences with therapy. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, so five. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so what I will do is skip to the bit about the intervention. So in terms of the intervention, we thought, how do we take what we have learned from people's narratives to make services different, to make services better? And we thought about four things. We knew that we needed to really hold those local knowledges as being valid. We need to create spaces for them to be seen as valid. We wanted it to be led by communities and so they can drive their own responses with the vision of who they are as, as their identities. Um, and we wanted the content of the intervention to vary because trying to deliver it in these different spaces, it had to achieve slightly different ends. So this was our theory of change. And really what I want to draw your attention to is that we worked with communities in a workshop with about 100 community members for a day, sort of doing participatory activities to map out these different pieces. So what is the most important part of context? What are the outcomes that you want? What do you want to see in your life? And then we sort of went away as our sort of research team to sort of build this bit in green to think about what the intervention needed to be. So we decided to run participatory learning and action groups as an, an intervention where the aim of those groups was to build connections between community members and formal structures and to establish leaders in communities who felt like they were able to contribute to bettering mental health. And so this is the four stages of, those, of that intervention. In the first reflection stage, people have an opportunity to build awareness, that consciousness raising about mental health and its connection to their social worlds. In the second stage, they identify and prioritize problems. Uh, then in the third stage, they set out a plan of action, sort of for like action projects. And then the fourth stage, they evaluate. The cycle sort of repeats over and over. And so to talk about what that meant in, in practice. So these are the posters from some of the groups um, that were presented at a community forum where the different groups presented their ideas to representatives from the wider social welfare sector. Um, showing them what their plans were to improve their mental health. I think what's really important to hold on to here is that these didn't become classic in interventions like, I need more information about depression or anxiety. It was, how do we restore intergenerational dialogue? How do we create opportunities to help people be safe? Um, how do we uh, give young people access to better education? How do we um, create a holistic idea of community, this one here, Education para Conviviar. And uh, that was my favorite one. They sort of created these sort of, co-created these community rules about what it meant to be in their community. They went around to everyone, they did a video, and they created this sort of whole paradigm for how they want their community to live. Um, and all the interventions were varied, and they all had positive impacts on people's mental health. So we're just now doing the write up of our evaluation. There was a significant reduction in depression, a significant increase in mental health well being for all of the people who participated in the groups. And most importantly, in our photo voice evaluations, people talked about the afterlife of their projects, the fact that what they did would stick around for longer than just those eight weeks they were working together. So for me, the future of mental health is really about, or global mental health is about finding a bravery to change our definitions so that we can accept that adversity is often chronic and so what we need to be doing is creating spaces for people to repair, in, achieve repair when it is possible to do so. That mental health is about more than the prevention of illness but actually about doing things that create good mental health in their lives. That an intervention that is owned about a community can, by a community can also be the foundation for structural social change, um, and that we can be working in both the short and long term 
when we are working with community actors in this way. Uh, and then the last slide is, you know, this idea of how do we do this. And I, I really think that community-led development as an orientation to how we engage with communities about their mental health sort of offers this really powerful approach to do that shift, to see that shift in real time. And so some people might talk about it as co-production or co-design, but I think if transformation is the ideal, then we're always trying to get towards this dream. But I'm a bit of a pragmatist like my former PhD supervisor. So I think it's also important to think about the ways in which we build toward that long-term dream, which is also really important. And I will stop there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for not falling asleep. I have a smooth jazz voice. So whenever I do a lecture at like 9 or 10 AM, it's lights out for everyone. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> okay, I'm sure you all have questions, but I'm kind of hoping you don't have questions because I have lots of questions to ask. Her. But I will give you guys priority. Um, so please think of your questions. Again, I want to emphasize there's always a pattern that at the beginning I only see men asking questions, and by the end I see lots of women with questions. So be brave at the start yeah. so we can have a good balance. Uh, Philippa, would you like to, to offer your uh, yeah. comments? And you can, you, whichever you prefer, but we can turn, I think we can turn this on. Or well, maybe they're already on. Yeah, okay, I'll stay here. That will be more cozy. Okay. Okay, um, well, thank you, Rochelle, for such a, um, you know, a talk which it was so rich, full of both theory and practice. It's so rare, actually, to um, have the opportunity to uh, discuss with someone and to hear from somebody who is so kind of has one foot so firmly in the kind of academic world, and but also the other foot so firmly in practice. Um, and I think that really came across. Uh, so. Uh, um, Thank you for, for kind of explaining all of those the di different dimensions of your work to us. And thank you to uh, Laura and James and the Cutting Edge team uh, for inviting me to discuss Rochelle's work. It's a great privilege and pleasure, and I've had the best time the last, over the last week reading, uh, having the, the kind of extra impetus and reason to read lots of Rochelle's work. Um, and thanks to you guys for coming along. Um, on your Friday evening um, and listening and hopefully participating. Um, so yes. Okay. Um, so I think um, in her talk today, uh, Rochelle um, didn't quite get into how much of uh, a kind of rebel she is. Um, she probably felt uncomfortable kind of positioning herself in that way. But, you know, I really want to emphasize to you how the global mental health movement um, has been growing in uh, strength in terms of its uh, institutionalization in top journals like The Lancet, um, its funding. Obviously, there's still nowhere near enough money for mental health. But yet, the global mental health movement has been quite successful in, in mobilizing some resources and raising issues of mental ill health uh, in international development as an important area to focus on. Um, and this kind of, it's, is it, it's not a juggernaut. It's nowhere near a juggernaut. But it's <gasps> sometimes feels like that. It feels like that to <laughs> Rochelle. OK. So but Rochelle is one of the voices that is kind of daring to call out some of the really deep problems with this kind of relatively new set of institutions and, um, uh, and ways of um, promoting, framing this issue in development, which is the problem of uh, medicalization and individualization of mental ill health these are critiques which also can be made to so many other of so many other uh, disease programs 
around the world and indeed a big inspiration, I think, uh, for Rochelle uh, and also for myself in working in global health was a different critique of a different juggernaut, which was the HIV AIDS programs back in the early 2000s, which Kathy Campbell here at the LSE wrote about in her book, which I think you said in one of your papers was the first book, global health book you ever read. Yeah. I think it was the second book I read after um, <coughs> Barnett and Whiteside's book on HIV. Oh, yeah. So wow. it was my second book that I read, and I think it deeply inspired both of us. And I would really encourage, even though it's about 20 years old now, it's, yeah, but it's, still, it's so still absolutely saying what we need to hear in global health and in international development more broadly. So please do um, take a look at Kathy Campbell's Letting Them Die, Why HIV AIDS Programs Fail. Um, and in that, she makes a similar critique that um, these often well-meaning programs reproduce structural violence by medicalizing and individualizing um, the problems that people face in their everyday lives and trying to solve these problems with, I mean, you know, at that point, I think they, the people, it was deeply problematic that medications weren't available. So this isn't an argument against medication in this case, but solving, but as you said, it's not enough. Um, and so, um, yeah, so, so Rochelle is really um, a, a critical voice. And um, I, I don't really have any uh, uh, sort of critiques of your presentation of your work. So really what I'm gonna discuss is more of a more questions that I have for Rochelle. Also, I should say that I've been working on community development in the health financing sector, inspired very much by Kathy Campbell, but I've just recently started moving into mental health. Um, so I have lots of questions and lots of things that I want to discuss and learn um, from Rochelle as I move into her area a little bit. Um, I've been working on refugee and undocumented migrant access to mental health services in the NHS in, in England. Um, so, but, so what is so radical about what Rochelle is saying? Because maybe if you don't work every day in these kind of spaces, it might not quite strike, you, you may not quite understand the, the real radical nature of what she's saying. The radical nature is that a classic um, intervention of this type if, if in this part of the world that one would imagine would be that um, clinical psychologists or some type of psych professional, whether psychiatrist, clinical psychologist, counselor, come along and identify individuals who have, uh, who, who they diagnose with mental uh, health issues, with mental illnesses. So they would use a diagnostic manual, the DSM, the ICD codes, an international diagnostic manual. They would identify individuals who they would then invite to treat with some form of therapy or medication. Um, Rochelle does something completely different, which is she takes as her starting point the whole community. So she doesn't sort of cherry pick individuals who meet a certain threshold, but she says the whole, the site of mental ill health and mental well-being is the community, not an individual. Is that okay that I'm saying that? Yeah. And so, and that in itself is already a very brave starting point which departs from the mainstream. Um, and then she designs or co-designs interventions which uh, bring the entire community into a form of uh, service delivery so that um, people who may identify as somebody who has mental health problems or somebody who doesn't identify in that way are all part of the conversation and who are all part of trying to build more uh, healthy communities, better well-being. And, um, okay, so what, so, so this is what Rochelle is doing as I, as I read it. Um, now, I came across in my research people who I think believe the same things that Rochelle believes. They are working in, within the institutions, within the um, mental health institutions, in this case in the NHS, um, 
they are clinical psychologists who told me that they have very deep humanitarian, passionate deep humanitarian beliefs, that they've worked maybe in the past with MSF in um, the Global South, in conflict, they've been treating PTSD. So, so th I was working with people who treat PTSD. And they were saying to me, look, they were, we were talking, so we're talking about uh, refugees and undocumented migrants, and they were talking about the hostile environment. And for those of you who are new to the UK, the hostile environment is a term that the government itself uses proudly to describe its policies in immigration. Okay, this is a, in, this is not a critic. This is not this term is not a critique that, that, that Rochelle is or anyone is using. This is an intentional set of policies to make institutions and the immigration system as hostile as possible. Okay, the people who I was interviewing in my research were telling me this is the source of most of my traumatized patients suffering. It is, it is the, the structures, the, the, um, the institutions within which they must live their lives. But, but they did what Rochelle said, what are we supposed to, they kind of said, well, what are we supposed to do? I'm a trained clinical psychologist. And they didn't say, I'm going to go and do community work and community development. They said, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to try my best to try to um, add on social interventions for my clients, right? So they said, I can't, I, I know that there's no point in treating the PTSD until I've helped this person secure better housing. Or, but, because that, securing the better housing will be a large part of their um, uh, feeling, of, of a reduction of their symptoms. And this has been theorized by the anthrop French anthropologist Didier Fassin as uh, 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 something called bio-legitimacy. So this is legitimacy that people gain through their biology. So rather than accessing decent housing or other types of social welfare as a matter of right, they access this as a matter of their ill and suffering body or mind. And so populations are segmented and categorized as mentally ill or not mentally ill, and those who are mentally ill get some kind of extra supports for, to access the human rights that they in fact already have, okay? And the problem, so, and this happens, I think, in so many different mental health arenas. And this is one of the questions that I have for Rochelle, which is, um, I believe in the global mental health movement. There are people who, who, who passionately do want to do more than prescribing pills. It's, it's, it's many people, it, it is important to prescribe pills. I don't think anyone is saying that, that, that should not be happening, but that um, there are many people who who want to do more, who want to address the structural causes of people's mental anguish, and they sort of, but they do it from within institutions. So you can think of theorists like James Scott or Michel Foucault, who talk about these forms of resistance which are often invisible from above or from the outside, but there are people hustling, right? There are people hustling within institutions that might, the institutions might look structurally violent from the outside. But maybe, and I want to ask Rochelle, is it the case from the inside there are people who are trying to make these structural changes but from within? Now for me, I saw some successful cases of this and some really unsuccessful cases of this because when people's social welfare becomes an add-on, a kind of optional add-on, it becomes discretionary. Mm. And the mental health practitioner can choose actually, whether or not to add it on or not. They sometimes feel they're not choosing because of austerity and cuts. They, say to me, they said to me, I, I can't, I know I should be doing this work to connect these people to help the structural, uh, to, to, to address the structural determinants of their ill health. But I am so burnt out, I am so exhausted, my health service is so cut by austerity that I can't do that for these people, and what did they end up doing? They actually just took them off the waiting list, and they said, we can't treat those people. 
So paradoxically, these well-meaning people ended up excluding the most marginalized people from care because they were so well-meaning as to say that their mental ill health could not be solved without dealing with these structural issues, which they felt powerless in the end to solve. So one of my questions, Rochelle, for you is, do you come across this in your work? What are your thoughts about this way of operating? Did you consider working in this way? Why do you feel for yourself that it's not a way that you want to work? I mean, I might have already said a lot about why it's not a good <laughs> idea, but I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts because it is, I would say, um, anyway, it, a, a, a more of a sort of mainstream possibly way of, of, of trying to address these social determinants. The last question is much more simple. Um, and probably much more familiar to all of you in terms of the concepts, which is just about community development and the dynamics from within communities. So you didn't talk today uh, much about or, uh, the, the dynamics within communities in terms of the unequal distribution of power. So we know that when we do community development, um, and this is something I have worked on for, for a long time, um, that those with the loudest voices, those with the most social capital, often end up appropriating a community development process and being able to direct it into the, direction, into the avenues that, that are more um, beneficial to them. Because as we know, communities are not homogenous and they are, um, of course, uh, 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 subject to power relations um, as is everywhere and everything else. So how do you deal with that? I would be very curious about how you deal with that dynamic as you work with communities. And then part, another part of that community dynamic that I've often come across and that I've been writing about in the past is about those individuals who don't seek to appropriate the community development process, those community members, but those community members who, for one reason or another, have the greatest capacity to say those health leaders that you talked about, mm -hmm. to take on those leadership roles. And those people are often also incredibly burnt out. Because for some reason, the person who volunteers to run the mental health program or the community-based health insurance program that I was work programs that I was working on are also happen to be the same people who run the irrigation system. Mm -hmm who teach in the local school, who sit on all of the committees. Those are the people, those community leaders, and they are absolutely overburdened and overwhelmed. And when we leave these community projects in there, um, you know, for, for them to uh, lead, um, it jeopardizes the process because they are so absolutely um, uh, overburdened. And, um, and which leads to the critique that for many of these issues like financing healthcare, and I don't know so much about mental health, the state, we cannot, that, that, that we are asking too much of, the critique mm. is that we're asking too much of communities yeah. and that we need state, the government states to take that responsibility yeah. for these very complex and arduous development mm. and social welfare yeah. tasks. So, with that, I've talked too long. I'm sorry, Laura. No, um, that is, those are my uh, very uh, complex <laughs> questions that I have for you, yeah. Russia. Okay. You. I'm going to give you a few minutes, but I also want to make time for students yes. as well. Do, can, I t can we take, like, two student questions? Yes. yes. Just, let's do that. Maybe if anyone has a question that's linked to anything like that. Yeah. Okay. So, we have one down here, the lady in the white cardigan, and a lady up here in a red Jump, jumper. Now I need to encourage men to raise their hands. <laughs> and one, there's one. Okay, do you want to take three then? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi there. Um, is this on? Yes. No. You're close enough that I can hear you. Okay. Um, so my name's Duffy. I actually have a background in global health um, and I've done a lot of work on um, uh, like distal and proximal mental health impacts on people sexual and gender-based violence. Um, so my question is two-part, and it's somewhat um, related to that. So one, how do you convince development practitioners and funders to focus on improving distal mental health outcomes 
um, and strengthening deficiencies within social deter other social determinants of health rather than simply focusing on solving what's on fire in this precise moment while acknowledging that what we are doing right now is frequently not enough. Um, and the second part is um, coming from someone who did work in community health and got very burnt out. How do you prevent burnout among mental health practitioners or those of us who are um, inspiring mental health practitioners that want to work within the humanitarian field? Okay, fabulous. Uh, hi, it was really great to have a female speaker today, so thank you. Um, I'm Michaela, I'm from South Africa, so I just wanted to ask a bit about the work that you've done in South Africa um, and specifically how you think uh, community-led development works in a context after apartheid um, with such bad inequality, high rates of gender-based violence, a lack of a functioning health care system, you know, whether it's mental or physical, um, but also mental health as a kind of race and class issue where it's often seen as a white or a upper class issue, um, as well as you mentioned kind of, um, kind of in a post-conflict um, society in a context like South Africa where we didn't really prosecute anyone for what they did um, during apartheid. Uh, and the last part of the question is just you mentioned that your Spanish is getting better, so I was just wondering how's your Zulu? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't, and this gentleman here with the, the LSE. Hello. Hi, my name is Heiko. Um, I just have a question in the context and the case study that you've presented, um, which I think that would be really helpful when I get back to the field one day. Um, so I know that the issue of mental health is widespread. Uh, going back to the case of Colombia, uh, I wonder, as you emphasize a lot on community-based uh, approaches, I wonder on what criteria did you use in selecting such community and how are other neighboring communities are involved uh, as an important starting point on where a geographical location we start uh, on, on this matter um, and specifically on the problem analysis. Uh, that's it. Thank you. The, sorry, the problem analysis? Yeah, on why such community and not the neighboring communities if okay. possible. Thank you. Okay, let's start with these three. And Philippa's many questions. <laughs> Sometimes I think I miss the LSE. <laughs> and then I realize I really do. Um, I want to talk about, I'm going to start. Oh, yeah, I was wondering. Am I loud enough? <clears throat> Bob, but I also know I'm being recorded, so. Ooh. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, that's much better. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, James. So I will start with Philippa's because I think it leads into um, being able to answer. Did you say Duffy and uh, Michaela's, some of Michaela's questions? Um, so this idea of working within, from within the profession and the necessity of, I, I mean, I think these aren't either or things. I think they are examples of the multiple types of work that need to be happening concurrently in order for change to happen. Uh, when I did my field work for my PhD, one of my, P my papers for my PhD is actually on practitioner perspectives and practitioners who are saying how they subvert the system. They made up their own diagnostic category that sort of allowed you to hold on to complexity. And it was in those dialogues with them that I sort of made the decision, one, that I would not become a practitioner, because I'd been playing around with that idea for a while. And two, that I, I would spend time, I would continue to drive critique because you can't keep asking people to work in broken systems. There needs to be some type of space and some type of work that is happening simultaneously to change that system from the outside. The reason that we have to do these microcosms of resistance is because the stuff on the outside is taking too long. So somebody needs to be on the outside shift, trying to shift policy, trying to create that other space, trying to talk about different things, trying to create examples and models that people are taught that enable that kind of work to just become a part of regular practice. If we continue to think that we will just sort of like treat the individual social dimensions of people's lives and see change, 
you will never stop practitioner burnout, ever. You will never fix an unequal system created by apartheid. There needs to be work happening at multiple spaces at, at any given time. I've recently been really inspired um, by the work of Deepa Iyer, or yeah, Deepa, Deepa Iyer? Um, and she writes about social change ecosystems. I don't know if people are familiar with this ecosystem, social change ecosystem map. The thing that's so fantastic about her work is it reminds us that you need, what's that, maybe 12, 11 or 12 different roles that are all contributing to this shared goal of justice, liberation, solidarity. Storytellers, guides, experimenters, frontline responders, visionaries, builders, caregivers, healers, disruptors, you need all of them. It's only through the, that cumulative work because justice work is painful. I think we can see in the world right now that we are in a very painful, heavy moment. I, I'm here, I've been struggling a lot personally. I sort of struggled with how much of that to reveal, but I think it's important to sort of name the weight that you carry when you do that work and name the weight of the world that exists around you and to make time for grieving that, to make time for holding loss. Nobody's giving us time to do that right now. It seems impossible. Um, I'm a big crier, so don't be surprised that will come. But I, I, will, I will say that I think a lot of burnout comes from not having enough space to fall apart at the things that you see, at the things that you witness, at the things that you are asked to carry as a practitioner, as a, somebody working for justice, as somebody working on the front lines of harrowing things, as somebody connected to hard places at hard times, the suffering of others. There are things you carry that you pick up that need to be put down. You have to put them down Otherwise, everybody will be burned down. And so a better system is one that recognizes how it's connected to those things, to those violences, and cares for people within them. And I think uh, you guys are the ones that will build a better world than the one we have. And I think the systems that you build will be aware of that, because we're actually in a space where people are able to talk about their mental health. I also have lived experience of the use of mental health systems that have been a little bit racist, not so bad, because I was in Canada <laughs> uh, okay. at the time. Um, but I think the fact that I can say that now, I could not have said it 10 years ago. So I think a part of that work is also about recognizing any small wins that you might be able to. Um, the, the point, Michaela, my Zulu was always bad. Zulu is very hard. Uh, it got okay, but then I didn't go back. I went, I did some work in South Africa with the Koza population, and then I, see, it's all right. There's like bits inside of me that really want to get back to, to be able to, to do that. Um, I think, Community-led work in South Africa, is a, it's a really interesting question. It's a, I was sat in the green room and I realized that I was sitting next to Nelson Mandela's photo. And my brain just sort of exploded a bit, uh, as well as my uh, heart. But I, Inga Peterson, who is a mentor of mine, who is connected to the global mental health movement and is one of those people who, um, resonates very deeply with a lot of the critiques and limitations that I've been talking about today. Her work has always been about trying to strengthen a system, trying to enable a system to appropriately hold community-led work. Because in an unequal space, in a historically unequal space, there needs to be um, also a seeding of power and also a resourcing of these organizations to enable us to get to a point of equity. And so then in order to do that, you sort of need to think about what types of resources the system needs to create a space where people are able to better mobilize and work 
in relation to it and with it. Um, and so she has used the moment created by the movement for global mental health to do some really amazing systems work around the primary health care system because South Africa also has spectacular policy landscapes. Like the mental health policy in South Africa is beautiful. The implementation of it has been difficult. And so a big part of trying to work around that implementation is about how we sometimes think about research, I think, as redistributive justice. I don't know how many people say that about research, but I sort of see it as this thing to say, here is all this money, here. I noticed all the new buildings. <laughs> and how do we move that resource in order to do different things with it? And I think it is through the ways in which re research can be mobilized to drive system strengthening, systems work, and, and I don't really like the phrase capacity building, but I think it sort of, sort of will hold here. Um, is it Heiko? Heiko? Did I say that close to right? Okay. Um, your question connects to uh, your second one, Philip, around sort of like the reality of community dynamics and how do you choose which community gets something and which community doesn't. Um, so, I'll, I'll talk about two things. In the Columbia case, we started with community organizations and our community organizations told us where to work. I didn't go in and say, let's work here or not here. I didn't have that embedded knowledge of Kakata because I hadn't worked in Kakata before. But they did, they have been doing the work and they knew exactly where this work needed to be done and would resonate. But also, this is part of a much longer body of work. I, st I work a bit like an anthropologist. I go somewhere and I try to stay there until somebody tells me to leave. <laughs> but it's the idea that that community is, is the first of many and, we're con and, and we continue the work and, 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 and we've built a model. So a big part of making sure that a community, one community is one, is one of many, is that a lot of the additional partners to our work are strategically chosen like policymakers who would be interested in the intervention that communities designed. We also included an economic costing, something I never would have said before I came to the LSE. Canadi uh, like we did an economic costing of the, value of the intervention because we wanted to be able to say to people, this is how much it will cost. This is, it's cheaper than doing this. And you can do it here, and we will help you do it here. And here is the package for you to do it here. And those were the kinds of things we thought about when we started. So re that's the thing about, I think, action research sort of orients you to that, that question of what does your work leave behind. But because we started with that, this idea of sort of conflict and in, internal conflict in communities, uh, internal dynamics, it made me actually think of some work that I've done in Nigeria. And I worked on this trial. Um, to improve the health of children under five, children with pneumonia. And it's a, it was a, a participatory intervention. And when we did the scoping work for this study, we did this huge thing called, we did community conversations. So you, I'm, you know the method. So we did that in this big community of place with close to 300 people. And we talked about power then. So before we went to do this intervention, we had a fairly good idea of where the problems with power would be. And that's where we started. So I think how you get around that is you assume, always assume, that there will be problems with power because you're dealing with people and people are imperfect. And, and so how do you anticipate that? And so in the intervention, we had a session that was on power dynamics in households because the intervention stood no chance if you didn't have a space to talk about that before. And that's only possible because we started with those questions before we did the, before anything else. But typically when you do scoping work, it's very limited. 
you know, I, I had like four months and a huge team of amazing sort of young researchers in, in Jigawa. And we designed this thing of huge conversations in communities. And it, because that was resourced, we were able to do it. So I think it's also in research and thinking about how seriously we take learning from past mistakes and, uh, and costing methods that allow us to do that. Yeah, building it in right yeah. from the start. Okay, we have a question uh, upstairs here, and let's have the gentleman at the front. <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Riwa, and I'm from Lebanon. My first question is about so mental health, typically societal views around it. So you see in many communities, just talking about mental health is still a taboo. So what would you do to address this issue before you even start a particular intervention? Um, and my second question is about COVID. How do you see COVID did affect the whole access to mental, uh, mental health services and public health in general? Sorry, what was your name? Could you say it a bit? Riwa, R-E-W-A. Riwa? Yes. Hello, my name is Jaron. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I had a question relating to the limitations of the biomedical model, and I think throughout your talk you kind of refer to, uh, you sort of reference capacity building, improving the functionalism of different communities as a social process through community, but could you also talk about the dream and care and the sort of pragmatic tensions that you encountered and why you think these are relevant to the... You want me to redo the end of the talk? <laughs> Did you feel I rushed it? I felt I rushed it too. I think that's fair, Jared. Not that you rushed it, but um, more about... You, you mentioned there's like a pragmatic tension. Why mm. do you find that... Why do you find there to be a tension? Mm. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Okay, and the lady up here in the green jumper. Uh, thank you for your presentation. My name is Marina. Um, I'm a postgrad student. Um, so Could you I'm speak a little bit more into the microphone? Okay, like this is better. Yeah, and a bit so I just wanted to build slower. up a bit on the question of uh, Riva, um, and specifically with the context to uh, the slide that you presented about the uh, ex-guerrilla combat and uh, certain, um, let's say, uh, mechanisms that prevent them to access in the mental health. So, uh, do you have any specific? Like good practices or examples, whereas the uh, which enabled uh, these uh, types of population to engage with mental services, and what worked uh, specifically well um, with uh, med mental health interventions uh, towards the population who has a certain um, resistance of engaging with mental services. Okay, we'll we'll stop with those three, and I'm I'm hoping. Well, I think we'll have another round as well. Okay. I'll try and, I mean, I don't know, Jared asked a really deep question. Um, why, do I, what, why do I feel, I'm gonna start with that one because I think it sort of connects a bit to, to the others. The, prag, the pragmatic tensions I feel in my work. I think that comes, yeah, see, it's definitely gonna take a long time. I put the book down. I think it comes from, so this idea of trying to hold complexity also comes from my own, as I said, experience as a service user of formal mainstream services. So I really love that Philippa called me a radical. Um, I don't call myself a radical very much. Uh, but one of the, and I think one of the reasons that I don't feel as radical as some other voices in the global, in the, the critique spaces of global mental health, like uh, Derek Summerfield, for example, um, is that even with the limitations of the biomedical model, when I see somebody find repair in its use, that has validity, that has importance that has meaning because that is how that person has been able to achieve repair in their lives. 
Sometimes a diagnostic category does something amazing for a person. Something amazing, something powerful, something important. And if you really want to take equity seriously, equity is about enabling people to be able to make all, have all of the options available to them. And I think it would be inappropriate to say, just because you've got a broken social world means you shouldn't also have the right to say, actually, I think psychotherapy is great. It's about how do you, as like you were saying about the, the client, or some of your sort of participants talking about their clients, how do you treat PSD if you don't have any stability in someone's life? Maybe you create the stability in someone's life and see that as an important part of a process of enabling some sort of deeper therapeutic work. And there are modalities of therapy, things like systemic family therapy, which is if I do go into therapeutic practice, it will probably be there. Tries to hold um, sort of your sort of psychological well-being within the bounds of family dynamics, social dynamics, structural dynamics. Tries to hold that complexity historically in people's lives, but also remain like holding on to the fact that we we do still have individual choice. And so I think the pragmatic tension comes for me around saying trying to say that things are both necessary and insufficient. And that's where the big tension comes for me because my life would be much easier if I was either mainstream or a deep critic. But the fact that I try to sit across these spaces and force people to sit in that discomfort of being across those spaces is, is a tension, is hard. But I think that's why I find dealing with these notions of care and repair as such nice words that enable me to do that boundary crossing with people across disciplines, hopefully. Um, I think that's what Kit was trying to say when she was like, if you're looking to convince people this idea of repair might really help you not have to have so many uncomfortable conversations with psychiatrists. It's only psychiatrists who yell at me at, when I go to talks. Um, and then the nurses hug me. I always find that really interesting. Um, but also, yes, I, there are amazing psychiatrists who, I mean, Derek Summerfield's a psychiatrist. Like, his critique is embedded in his practice of psychiatry. So I'm not batting up psychiatrists. Um, so this idea around, um, it was Rewa's, and um, I'm sorry, the post, this was a PhD student, I didn't catch your name, you said it's super fast. Postgraduate. Did you say Marina? Marina, okay. Um, this idea of like mental health and society, how do you, when there's a lot of stigma around mental health, how do you do that work? I think what has been really interesting coming from the Columbia work, right, when you're trying to sort of access sort of the general population, we found that a lot of people sort of came to the intervention with their stigmas. They brought them there. And I think sometimes if you do it the other way, where you sample people who have a diagnostic category or whatever, you actually aren't enabling the contact that is necessary for stigma to be broken down, really. Um, and so we had these really interesting moments of awakening for people um, within these groups who were able to feel that mental health was about more than they had anticipated it was being about. This through, I mean, the big mechanism that underpins the intervention that we designed is dialogue, is dialogue within your group and across groups, because it's the cross-group dialogue that becomes the opportunity for sort of transformation and things like that. Um, and so I think that's very much how, how we did it and how we saw um, the former guerrilla members start to think differently about mental health in relation to themselves, in relation to their ongoing work um, and mobilization work uh, in their communities, actually. Um, and then, Rewa, you always also asked a question about access to mental health during COVID. Something really interesting happened in COVID, whereas that usually it takes everyone about 10 years to realize mental health is a thing, and it took them about five minutes, which I was pleased about but not satisfied. 
And the piece in Nature that was mentioned was about, came from like a rant. I was on some sort of thing and I was ranting and I had no idea who was on this mail list. And someone said, can you write that in a thing? And I was like, I guess, let's try. I'll just record myself yelling in my office. But what we sort of found, what I sort of thought about there was that it changed, it opened a space for people to think about mental health, but the ways in which we responded didn't change. So you had a lot of discussion about the power of um, e-mental health and mobile mental health to like create waves of access for people who had never had access before. That was happening in a way that was totally decontextualized from things like, well, the people who have access to that kind of like capacity are always the same people. It's not the most marginalized of the marginalized. It's not, you know, most of the global south, which will, and, and inequities within the global south that sort of determine your ability to access um, sort of reliable internet for you to be able to do some sort of online CBT course. Um, but, but also that, you know, COVID also reminded us of how deeply embedded these social inequalities are. Um, and I just felt a bit, for me, that the way the mental health response happened just sort of mirrored existing inequalities. It wasn't an opportunity to sort of do deep transformative work, but it did still open a space, I think, more comfort for people, for policymakers to actually start talking about mental health. And I think that's really important because if you can get policymakers and have conversations with policymakers around things like financing and, and why it's so important it's so costly for you not to invest in these things, then that is a huge part of the battle, I think. Okay, so I want to fit in, the, the, there's a question up at the front here, and there's a question here. Rochelle, how many questions do you think you can answer in 10 minutes? Mm. While, while paying attention to your own mental health. Bearing in mind people, they how can many also people who are asked are about <laughs> to ask questions are also staying for the drinks portion of this evening. <laughs> That's a very good way of. Let's see how far we go. If you feel my answer was incomplete and you would <laughs> like more, find me at the bar. Assuming there is a bar, I don't know what the. Uh, so we have yeah. two, and then there is about three more. Ooh. Not counting my own questions, but I will ask you them later. <laughs> well, maybe we and could, James has a question. Maybe we could hear all of all the of questions them. and not answer all of the questions. Okay, yeah, okay. let's do I'll that. See how so I can let's connect start them. down here. Okay. Um, hi, I, can you hear me? No, my dear. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. My name is Shah. Um, so I think you talked a bit about the value of expanding kind of the limited diagnostic categories in mental health, and, but I was kind of wondering how we can go about enforcing that in clinical settings. Um, and I'm thinking kind of about Joseph Gaughan, his work on First Nations healthcare workers and mm. the use of the diagnostic category of historical and intergenerational trauma to recognize a whole range of different symptoms from like depression, substance abuse, suicidal ideation, and other like physical comorbidities. Um, and then kind of how that diagnostic category has been used to demedicalize and de-pharmaceuticalize healing and treatment approaches um, that can emphasize a reconnection with indigenous culture and language and community. Um, sorry, it's a really not a question. dark question. But it's not dark at all. Long question, sorry. No, oh, I thought you said dark. I was like, it's not dark. That was super hopeful. Okay. Okay, and the question here, and could you just pass it down this row? This whole row is yeah. a productive space. <laughs> but we're going to go upstairs first. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name's Aisha. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my question's actually pretty short, hopefully. Um, so I was actually interested in some of the methodologies that you mentioned, namely being participatory action research. Um, so I'm just wondering, did you experience any roadblocks or challenges through using PAR, um, maybe perhaps in a socially conservative context? Um, and if so, how did you mitigate this? Fantastic. Hi, um, my name's sorry, my name's Daisy, um, and I was just really curious about, especially as we were talking, you were talking about Colombia and then South Africa. Um, so, do you think that 
these kind of community participatory mental health programs are as transformational as ADR, so alternative dispute resolution, especially when we have um, we had like the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Committee in South Africa. So do you think that it would harm the progress of like this, uh, this community approach to mental health or do you think it could benefit it or do you think they should work together or separately, especially in post-conflict um, mm. societies? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm just mm -hmm. into the microphone. Sorry, guys. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, a little okay. bit. Hi, I'm Mathilde, and Mathilde. I want to know how you're handling having these results that are very real, but mostly qualitative, and having the pressure from founders and government to be able to prove to them what's happening quantitatively. So I was working last year on the a community based mental health program in Scotland that had amazing qualitative results, practitioners, community, and individuals really, really excited. And the pilot was funded by the government, but to be able to have that quality, they had to cut down the number of people they were supporting. And so the conclusion from the government was, you're not meeting the targets. It's not meeting what we're expecting. And so we're not considering this result. And the program got shut down. And I was wondering, are you getting some freedom from being an academic and not having to report your results in the same way as getting this private government funding? Or is there, yeah. How are you handling, supporting, and creating this new project? Okay, and this will be the final question. And speak with it like this. Okay, um, hi, I'm Zara. I'm from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, I'm just wondering, even within a community, obviously adversity leads to different manifestations of mental illness, and to what extent are community-led approaches indifferent to that heterogeneity in mental health conditions? Um, might there be a place for some kind of person-centered elements um, to acknowledge that? And also, to what extent should communities bear the burden for their own treatment um, and the capacity for them to do that, um, even through suffering adversity? And have you seen any adverse effects on communities in your work? OK. So Rochelle, we, we do need to finish in, in about four minutes to six. <laughs> so good luck. <clears throat> Sha, I had not heard of the use of uh, intergenerational trauma as a diagnostic category before. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's really powerful. Um, I think there is a lot to learn from indigenous communities in Canada and the way that they are able to have ownership in health-related spaces. Um, some work that I do in Southwest London around mental health systems change uh, draws on some sort of s interventions, like similar things. Um, but I'm just basically I'm saying thank you for telling me that. I'm going to tell them about it. I um, I don't think about expanding diagnostic categories. I think about expanding responses around existing diagnostic categories. I think regardless of your the whatever category label they give you, there should be an opportunity for you to bring your full self to a space. So I, I'm not a diagnostic categories person, um, even though I recognize there's lots of interesting stuff going on there. Um, Aisha asked me about methodologies, PAR. Um, I'm going to connect this to Mathilde's question uh, about funders. So one of, the big, one of the big roadblocks around doing PAR is how long it takes, like meaningfully to do PAR, it takes a really long time. Um, or any meaningful co-production work will take longer than the space of a regular grant. Uh, and I think that I do this work in parallel to other work that I do in other spaces where I sort of critique the way funding is allocated for certain types of projects. I think those, that work has to go together. Um, in the meantime, while I'm waiting for that kind of change to happen, one of the things that I ultimately end up doing is a lot of like unpaid foundational work. So I work in places where I have known people for a very long time. I 
use my life resources to maintain those relationships to support their independent projects of change and when the opportunity emerges for us to transition funding from the academy to community spaces we then are able to take to make use of that um, and I think that that uh, that sort of tension around how we talk about impact is part of a much broader problem with how we talk about impact and define impact um, and maybe that will be the next thing I talk about when I come back in another 10 years time or something <laughs> um, was it Daisy yeah your question about ADR I think that community participatory participatory approaches sort of go in parallel with those things. I don't think they sort of necessarily dis potentially disrupt them. I think they potentially could be a, a mechanism through which people think through what retribu like restoration, retribution, reparation needs to look like um, from like a, a bottom up. I, I think they're sort of in relation to each other. Um, interestingly, a, a very long time ago, I wrote a paper with a colleague of mine, Geneviève Menel, who does a lot of work on in the violence against women space. Uh, and she was doing work in Rwanda and she was one of the things she looked at was how like women groups around violence are actually just mental health spaces you'd be surprised about how many places that were already doing good mental health work it's just that we're stuck in this problematic limitations of the definition of what mental health is and isn't and so I would encourage you at this thinks back to burnout we don't need to automatically create new things. We could look at what's happening and look at what the benefits are for mental health to scaling up this existing practice or tweaking this existing practice rather than adding new things. Where we worked in Colombia, there were no things to add to, so we created new things. Um, and then I think the last question was Zara uh, around how does community-led approaches leave space for individual need? Is that about right? Um, I think it depends on the type of intervention you create. I think there aren't a lot of them right now that acknowledge the need for people to access individual support before they can come into a group. But it's definitely something that I have found in some of my other intervention work that I've done with women who've experienced uh, trauma is that sometimes your trauma is so live that actually you cannot participate in a group setting and you need to have some individual work that's happening alongside of that to move you back into it. And I think there's one program that I heard of in Guatemala where it was actually structured that way, which is um, sort of the first time I heard about someone trying to do PAR um, for mental health they, and, they, and they had this separate individual space and in all of my projects we start with the community there's no diagnostic barrier for entry but when people do come in if we see that they are in need of help there is funded mechanisms for them to access that that is a part of what gets budgeted into every project which is another thing that is not I think normal practice but probably should be and I think I did it did I do it yes. yeah that was very impressive <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Rochelle. I have to say, and I'm not just doing this to sweet talk you, this was one of my favorite cutting edge lectures that I've heard in the last few years. Um, and I think it, it's helpful for thinking about how this moves across disciplines. I was sort of thinking as I was listening to you talk about within economics and within agricultural science, the degree to which practitioners believe themselves to be kind of observing passively phenomena in the world, or whether they're kind of aware of the infrastructure through which their disciplines are produced, right? Through which economics or we, through which agriculture works. So I want the students to kind of think about the ways that different disciplines are kind of aware of the way that the knowledge system is part of the, you know, the system. Um, so, yes, let's thank her again for this great talk. Uh, I also want to draw your attention to next week's talk, which is the Russia-Ukraine War, Consequences for Global Security and Development. We have three speakers. 
um, uh, Julia and Anna will be talking particularly about the, the, con the conflict within Russia and Ukraine. David Luke is an economist who will be speaking particularly about the impacts on the global economy and particularly within African countries. And Mark Loco is also get t sort of taking that global uh, view of, of the impacts of this war on other countries and on the, the global context for development. So please join us for next week.